My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens. This is the show about having the power to choose what you actually want to do in business and life and then having the courage to miss out on all the rest. My name is Patrick McGinnis, also known as the creator of the term FOMO, and I'm here in AW360 Studios in New York City. New York, of course, is the city with FOMO served up with your morning coffee. We know FOMO well here. And today, I'm gonna be talking with a special guest about an important topic. I think something that many of us don't think about on a daily basis, but it's about how life's twists and turns can affect the choices we make, our priorities, and how we live our lives. If you think about it, we live lives that are very busy and complicated. So I think back to the last time I was bored, and it was probably the day that I, before I got my first iPhone, because from that moment forward, I've had my iPhone in my pocket, and every time I have a free minute, I pull it out, I'm on Twitter, I'm on the New York Times, I'm on my email, I'm texting people, I'm WhatsApping people, I'm on Facebook, I'm on, you know, every other app you can think of, and I never take time just to step away and be bored. And in fact, while we are so busy distracting our daily lives, things are happening all around us, things that could actually change the course of our lives. And there's a great quote by John Lennon from the song Beautiful Boy that says, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. And my guest today knows very well how something can happen in life that changes your priorities and causes you to think in a different way. My guest today is Sally Wolf, and Sally is what we like to say back in my homeland of Maine, wicked smart. She is a graduate of Harvard College. She is also a graduate of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. She started her career working in the media groups of Booz Allen and Goldman Sachs, and eventually moved on to a career at Time Warner in various capacities, including putting together an accelerator that focused on storytelling. She is from the New York area, lives in New York City, and uh, she's here with me in the studio. So welcome, Sally. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So I always like to start with the same question, which is, how do we know each other? Well, we met at our friend Danielle's wedding. Um, I think Danielle's a really close friend of both of ours, and what you probably didn't know is we met on my birthday. So I will never forget her anniversary or the day that we actually met. So it's it's that memorable, and we we're gonna give a shout out. We give a shout out to Danielle, obviously, for yes, introducing us. Big shout out to Danielle. So you um, you had this, you know, up to the point we're gonna talk about starting 2015, but up to that point, you know, I just went over your bio. You are a super super superstar, obviously, and you always will be. Thank but you. you had done this path that was, I assume, you know, we were talking last week. You were telling me about how you you were a senior in college at Harvard, and you were writing letters to TV shows like Entertainment Tonight to get um, to become uh, an intern. So you went off and you got a job in media. Tell me what you were doing up to that point. What kind of what did your life look like in 2015? So in 2015, as you sort of attested, I had a very traditional path after college, right? The consulting thing, the baking thing, um, ultimately ended up at a media company. And so that was, 2015 took me about 18 years out of college. So I'd been working in the same industry, had the best job I had ever had, was working for the best boss I ever had. And Yet I woke up and had this moment of, I'm not doing what in my heart of hearts I really want to be doing. I think it's so easy to choose an industry, to choose a job when we're 22, right? And if we're smart enough and do well enough and keep getting rewarded enough, whatever enough is, right? You pay your rent, you live your life. It's easy to not ever take a step back and say, am I actually happy, right? If some boss is saying, oh, you're doing a great job or you're up for this promotion or whatever it may be in the particular situation, it's easy to forget to say, is this the life I want to be living? And I had chosen the media industry when I was 22. I grew up in a family. My dad owned a clothing store that my grandparents started. My mom was a high school math teacher. They never changed jobs in their entire careers. And so it was easy for me to kind of choose this industry. I chose it because I knew nothing about the business world and thought choosing media, which I loved as a consumer, would be this great crash course. 
So fast forward 18 years later, and I realized the longer I worked in media, the less media I actually consumed, um, which was not the direction that you, you know, if you're going to chart that stuff out, that's not the direction that you hope that it's moving in. And then I saw this quote and it said, don't live the same year 75 times and call it a life. And I think we've all seen that sentiment or heard that sentiment before, but there was something about the way that that was phrased. So with all of that said, here we are, 2015, I had a really honest conversation with my boss and we had an amazing relationship. And I think that there's so many gifts that come with that. And one is the opportunity to be really transparent about you know, not only what you're doing day to day in your job, but also how you're feeling about it. And so I spoke with Lisa and we agreed, we had this big launch for this incubator. We had created this incubator where we were investing in storytellers in the same way that a tech incubator would invest in a startup company. It gave me the opportunity to be an entrepreneur within the company, which was amazing. And I loved that. So I really wanted to see through the big launch that we had coming up, which was in about four months in early February of 2016. So Lisa and I had this perfect conversation and we had a plan for me to see that through and then to exit the company. And become an entrepreneur, right? That was my goal. I didn't actually know an entrepreneur of what, but I knew enough that in my heart of hearts, I had loved building this incubator. It kind of reminded me, like, I think there's something to be said for when we reflect back on what we love to do as children, because I think we all at our heart of in our heart of hearts are who we always were. And as a kid, I was not I had maybe one doll, but I had Legos and blocks and I would build these amazing creations and I could be lost for hours in them. And I think there was something about having the opportunity to be what's an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur within a bigger company that led me to remember, I love to build things. And, you know, my career involved building a lot of beautiful PowerPoint slides or a lot of Excel models, but not really actually having something tangible that I could point to and say, wow, that was my idea. And I got to see it through and now it exists and it's doing amazing work for other people or it's adding something to the company that didn't exist before. And I really, really valued that. And so you have, as in a classic Sally Wolf style, you had a great plan, right? Okay, I mean, yeah. you, you clearly, I mean, if you look at your trajectory up to this point, you know, as you said, you, you built this, maybe it was a bit on the, it wasn't sort of off the beaten path, but it was certainly a very good, clean path that anybody can look at. You look at your CV and it all makes sense in a row. And then something happens to change. What? Right. what so tell us about that. Right. So about three weeks after Lisa and I had this, you know, seemingly perfect conversation about an exit, um, plan in place, all of that. HR even knew about the plan. So this was real. Three weeks later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And that's just one of those moments that no one expects. I think maybe I expected it a little bit more than someone else might because my mom had a history of cancer, but of breast cancer. But, you know, I got screened since I was 32. I kind of did all the things I was supposed to do. And I certainly didn't expect that at 40 and certainly didn't expect it when I felt like I had just made this big decision. And although I wasn't sure exactly what I was moving toward, I certainly didn't expect to be moving toward cancer treatment. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that I, I, it's interesting because we go back to that time and I I guess we, we, we knew each other at that time and it, it's one of those things that you don't hear about it necessarily directly from a person, right? You start hearing about it behind the scenes. And I didn't know that you were leaving your job, but I certainly knew that, you know, you had this big job at this big company. And then one day you were off getting treatment Mm -hmm. and then, you know, ended up going back for a period of time. So like, how did this experience, you know, when you found out this news, um, you know, this is kind of, this is obviously something that a lot of people have to go through in life. Not all people, obviously, but at your age, young, you were probably among the first of the people that you knew who had something like this occur in their life. Right. How did it change how you thought about your priorities? And, and you know, you had thought about maybe leaving and becoming an entrepreneur, and that's a very high-risk enterprise. Like, how did that shuffle the deck for you? So I had what I looked at as a gift, right? And cancer isn't obviously a gift when anyone receives that diagnosis. But what I had was at the time considered curable and highly treatable. And I had the luxury of having six months of paid medical leave from a job to think and to figure out, well, what do I want to do with what I saw as really a second chance at life? 
And I don't think that cancer changed my priorities. I think I knew what my priorities were, but I don't think I ever actually prioritized them, hmm. if that makes sense, right? Like I knew how important, I think I always spent a lot of time with my family. So, so that wasn't something that I needed to change. Although I, I did have the gift of having my family very involved with all of my treatment. And I never went to any doctor's appointments that were, you know, material appointments by myself. So I was really lucky in that way. But in terms of the job stuff, I knew I had wanted to leave Time Warner, but I wasn't exactly sure what I was leaving for. And I think that as much as I always wanted to try to build something, try my hands at entrepreneurship, right? All of those kind of things, it's easy to, to sort of talk myself out of that, right, over the course of my career. Well, I don't have experience being an entrepreneur, so what if it doesn't work out? And here's the thing, I didn't have experience fighting cancer either, but I had no choice, right? Someone handed me that cancer card and the only choice I had was to figure out how to fight it and how to get well. And that became effectively my job over the course of those several months. So fast forward to the end of treatment and, you know, I was tired and I was in the middle of breast reconstruction, which took a full year. I was bald at the time. I was physically changed. I don't know that I was actually emotionally or psychologically changed so much as fortified to know that it was worth pursuing whatever in my heart I thought worth pursuing. Because the absolute worst that could happen with a failed business venture is just that, right? It doesn't work out. And worst case, I would go get another job. And even the definition of failure, I think, and this is just not just cancer that I think it's just growing up has taught me so easy to to go through life with the pedigree that we have been lucky enough to have, the schools that we've gone to, and fear of failure. And I think in part, I feel failure because I or have feared failure because I was lucky enough to get to that point in my life without really having quote unquote failed. Right. I got one B plus in college and then everything what else class was that? That was physics. And oh, you know, man. I will tell you, I That's actually pretty still legit to, the, to get a B plus still in physics. to this day was physics with a lot of people who had studied a lot more physics, you know, <laughs> up to that point than I had. And still to this day, I can kick and scream and explain to you that had I studied actually harder for the, you know, I think there was a little self handicapping going on. Um, but I think it was, it was a gift that I got a B+. You're an overachiever, but that's okay. We still love you. (laughs) I know. And the fact that I graduated over 20 years ago and still, you know, have (laughs) issues with this, but I think it was a gift, right? Because had I gotten that A minus or better yet, an A, Harvard didn't have A pluses, by the way, still a gripe, but, um, (laughs) but had I gotten, had I not gotten a B plus, I might've actually majored in physics, which was my original plan. And I don't think I was meant to be a physics major. I loved physics. I loved math. I had, um, you know, amazing experiences with both in high school. But getting that B plus in physics led me to try Psych One the spring semester, and I had to make a decision because actually the higher level physics class and the first level of psychology met at the same time, um, which I still remember was Tuesdays and Thursdays at ten a.m. But regardless, that, that was a decision I had to make, and it took my dad saying, "Well, why don't you try psychology?" And then I thought, "Talk about FOMO." Well, if I don't take physics this semester, I'm going to be a semester behind where I'm supposed to be if I major in physics. Rather than looking at it as, "But if I don't take psychology, like Psych One, I may never discover which actually something I was meant to discover." Because right, fast forward all these years later, and. Most of the books that I read for pleasure are psych related. I took a five month positive psychology course while I was sick mm. with cancer. Um, I love psychology and it took tabling something else. It took that B plus to actually let me, but it's anyway, funny. That's, that's it's a little bit of a detour. No, speaking of psychology though, I mean, it's very funny you're saying this because when I was a senior in college, I was a, I was an econ major and a specific kind of niche part of econ. And I had mm. to take econometrics and I took the class and day one, I couldn't do the basic like review of the pre- previous semester. Mm-hmm. And it took my mom saying like, why don't you drop the class and, you know, change a little bit to give myself the permission to do something that I ended up being much more successful at. Right. So I think that happens to some of us that are overprogrammed is that we are so caught up in keeping up with the vision of what we had for ourselves that we don't allow ourselves to actually do the thing we probably are a lot better at doing. Um, and it Couldn't takes agree with you more life on to like one. step in on you. Um, okay. So I want to highlight something we talked about last week. Um, you mentioned your boss, Lisa Kiroz, said something to you about kind of 
the, how you could manage the process of getting well that I thought was really impactful. So the morning I was diagnosed with cancer, I and Lisa you know, knew I was waiting on this biopsy result and I shot her an email. I told one of my dearest friends first and then shot Lisa this email that I wasn't coming into work because it was cancer and I had to deal with it. And Lisa called me right away. It was God knows what time in California, but she called me and said something that I will never forget, which was, this is no different than any other project that you've managed before. This is where your executive skills come in handy. Yes, it's your body. Yes, it's cancer and all the emotional things that come along with that. But the actual skills that you need to get through this are the skills that you've spent your entire career and really your entire life, right, building. So I never forgot that because she was 100% correct. She knew this from experience, right? She knew this from experience. She had had um, a very early stage breast cancer uh, about five years before I was diagnosed and um, thankfully was totally okay from that. But she had lived that journey herself. And she also had a lot of relatives who had gone through cancer and honestly is just one of the most compassionate people I had known. And so anytime any employee had gotten sick on her team or anyone she knew, she really, I think, stepped in in a way that taught me a lot about how to step in for other people. And that advice was just spot on because it really was a, you know, a project in that sense. There were so many appointments to make, so many things that needed to be sent from Columbia, where I had my biopsy, to Sloan and Sinai, where I wanted to do consults. And, you know, it was a series of things, tasks that needed to be managed. And when I had something to do, it was actually great. It was a gift because when I'm focused and have to get something done, it gets done. In the moments where there was a lull in that, right, in the project, like something, nothing I needed to do. Everything was in everyone else's hands. Those were the moments where Mm -hmm. the fear and the anxiety and the sadness and all the emotions that you can imagine, um, were competing for attention in my heart. Um, that's when those things crept in. But, but Lisa's advice is advice that I've given so many other people who have reached out to me when they've been diagnosed themselves. Yeah. It really stuck with me. I wanted to ask you because I, as your friend on Facebook, I, you know, I follow you. I, I love your content actually. I mean, anybody who's friends with Sally knows that she's like a source of unending positivity and interesting kind of things. She, you know, does a lot of cool things. You like last weekend, you did cool stuff, but how did your, when you, when, you know, I found like, you know, when, when I'm not feeling well, like I don't want to engage with the world. How did your life online, social media, how did the communication with people? I'm sure lots of people were asking how you were doing. How did that change through this whole experience? So I made a decision I actually don't even know how conscious of a decision was, but I did not put this on social media until it was behind me. Um, Not far, far in the distant behind me, but enough behind me that I felt like I was in a place where I could handle the outreach. So I don't mean that I lived cancer in a bubble by myself, right? But it meant that I didn't have any Facebook posts about it. I didn't have any bald pictures that were posted on Facebook. I was diagnosed in December and didn't have surgery until February 11th. And so I had close to two months where I was navigating this, you know, what effectively was the beginning of a new normal with a relatively small circle of friends and family. And what I learned is as a self-proclaimed control freak, it's really hard to not know what's going on in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to not know when a friend asks. It's another thing to not know when 1,800 of my closest friends on Facebook um, might be inquiring. And so I would get these texts and I was still at Time Warner and still really busy preparing for this launch that we had in February, right before my surgery. And I get a text and let's say it's randomly Tuesday at 1 PM and someone's saying, how are you feeling? And at the time I was feeling great because before surgery and before chemo, cancer was this silent killer of sorts in my body, right? It was there and it was toxic and it had to come out, but physically I felt fine. And so I just realized in those moments or people would ask me, what are you doing? Like what, what surgery are you having? And until I figured it out that I ultimately, I lost both breasts, I had a double mastectomy, but that was a question mark, whether I was gonna do one or two. And until I knew and could give voice to it and felt confident in the decision I had made, right, about surgery, about treatment, 
it was really hard to answer questions and I didn't necessarily have the answers. And I also got as much love. I was humbled by the love and support that I received from the relatively small circle who knew. And by small circle, I don't know, we're talking 20, 30, 40 friends. Like it wasn't tiny, but it wasn't everyone. And then fast forward, I finished chemo in June of 2016. I um, went back to Time Warner for a few months starting in August And I was at dinner with some friends. It was a reunion of a group of friends that I had met on a trip to Israel several years before. And one of them wanted to post a picture on Facebook. And at that point, I'd stopped wearing my wig and I probably had about an inch of hair. And I was hesitant. And it was something I was never really hesitant about before because I'm fine, right? I'm out with friends. We had a nice time. I'm not a big poster myself, but if someone else wants to post and celebrate the fact that we had a really nice dinner, that's great. And I had this reaction of, ooh, but if you post that picture, I'm going to get a lot of questions. And what I realized in that moment was I was actually fine at that point. I felt good. I really do believe that there's, anytime any of us goes through something, we have an opportunity and maybe even a responsibility to share that journey with other people who could benefit from it and learn from it. And I knew that, and you made this point earlier, I got breast cancer on the early side But I knew that I was going to have a lot of friends or friends of friends who, unfortunately, just given the statistics, were going to follow in this path, right? I think it's something like one in eight women get breast cancer. And so with that, I felt good at that point. So I thought there was an opportunity. It was worthwhile to share that story. And also, if I put that story out there, I controlled how that story went out there. It wasn't other people talking, whispering assuming how I felt or how I was doing or whether or not I was going to be okay. So I put this picture up. I had taken a, I had done a bald photo shoot um, right after I finished chemo because I realized that I am someone who everyone who's ever been my friend knows I love to take pictures. Like before everyone had a camera with, you know, a camera on their phone. I was always walking around with a point and shoot and I love to take photos, but I realized that during cancer, I hadn't taken that many pictures. And I wanted to remember that, remember that time, have that bald, you know, have those photos. And so we basically, I took, I went with a photographer all over the city. It's something I wish every cancer patient could do to kind of like have that moment of celebration. So I didn't just put any picture on Facebook. I put this picture up. You control the narrative. (laughs) And I wrote something and I love to write. So I wrote a few paragraphs and, you know, I can't remember, but something like, you know, 700 likes and loves later, I I felt really loved. And it was the kind of thing, it was actually one of my most favorite moments with social media, because I think it taught me the good that social media can be, the support you can receive from it and the love that you can feel from people that honestly, like people were telling me, oh, this was so inspiring, but you've always inspired me. And that's someone I haven't seen since like fifth grade. So, you know, there's this opportunity in it, I think, to really connect. It's, it's not always what happens on social media, which is why I think I'm a little bit more selective in how I engage with it. Um, but I will tell you, I had this realization after the fact with that post, which was, you know, like I said, I, I sat down and I wrote something and I posted this picture and, and fast forward, I was on this panel actually at my Harvard reunion um, last year for my 20th reunion, and it was about all these twists and turns that life can, can deal you. And someone raised her hand and she said she felt really left out, like she felt behind everyone else in the room, which is so easy for any of us to feel. But I think especially you take a, a group of Harvard graduates and put them in one space and it's easy to feel like you're the one who hasn't accomplished anything. And it led me to think about that moment right? That, that post that I put on Facebook. And I, 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 my only thought in that moment was let me put this out there so that I don't care who posts what picture of me with an inch of hair, right? That was my main thought. Like, right. Hey, like I've gone through this, like, but I'm I okay. have no more F's left to give at this point. Right. Yeah. That was all I thought about. I took a picture from that bald photo shoot because I loved the picture. It was yeah. in this bright pink top and my head was bald. And anyway, it only occurred to me in that moment, this, I feel so behind everyone else. And I feel like I haven't done this like everyone else has done it. If anyone else was on their couch feeling sick from chemo and opened Facebook and saw that picture and read what I had written, 
I'm pretty sure they would have thought something like, wow, she really won cancer. And it's just like a reminder that I think we look at social media and what people choose to post. And, you know, I never posted when I didn't feel well from chemo because I didn't really see a point in it. But I think that there's this this reality of knowing that everything you see on social media is is carefully curated, even when someone's not actually thinking even about carefully. Even the celebrities carefully. are curating it. Believe it or not, Selena Gomez's life isn't as good as it looks. Right. Um, <laughs> if only I, I followed her. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't follow her either. Maybe. I won't It's okay. I won't judge you if you do. Um, okay. So I want to fast forward. You just talked about this experience at your reunion and you just had another experience where you went back to your business school reunion. And the reason why Sally's here today for everybody who's listening is because I had, I was going through Facebook on a Saturday, I believe I was working and I needed a little bit of a break and I was flipping through my Facebook page and there was Sally's post and I read it and I watched a speech that she posted from her reunion and I really was so meaningful to me that I immediately sent her a text at that moment. I said, like, what are, you, what are you doing in a couple of weeks when you come in and film with me? Because there's a lot more that's happened in your life since um, since what we just talked about. And you, you, know, you got ready to give this. You were invited because of the speech that you had made, I guess, at your undergrad to come and give a similar talk at Stanford. But again, life kind of came in and gave you a whole bunch of other stuff in the lead up to that speech. So tell us about what happened and about the speech you made and when you, I guess it was just a couple weeks back. Yeah, it was about three weeks ago. Um, so a few months ago in late February, I received an invitation from two of my classmates to speak at our reunion. I had suggested that they have a panel similar to the one that we had had at Harvard. And they said, we are going to do that. But in addition, we'd also like to have these two TED-like talks and you know, so-and-so is going to give one and we'd love for you to give the other. And in that moment, I thought, yes, because I'm a big believer of saying yes, even when everything else, what I was starting to say is I thought, hmm, I'm not sure if I have any new material. I put that other, I had spoken um, a couple other times and put those on YouTube. And so, you know, there was this thought of like, oh, what else am I going to say? And do I have anything else to say? And, you know, I'm also thinking I'm going back to this business school reunion and everyone else, my perception of everyone else is that they've accomplished so much in their careers, right? It's easy to be really gener- gener- uh, generous when we're looking at our friends and really hypercritical when we look at ourselves. So you can look at my LinkedIn and you were really thoughtful and generous about what you said about me earlier. But I look at my LinkedIn and think, well, you know, I haven't really found that perfect thing yet. And at any rate, so there was a lot going on in my head, but I thought, well, if they're inviting me to do this, I'm going to say yes. Sure. And I am going to say yes and get excited about it, which is what I did. And that said, about a week later, um, uh, life changed. So when I said yes to this speech, I thought I was saying yes to speaking about the twists and turns of life as if they were in the past for me. And um, about a week later, my oncologist in a checkup felt a new lump. And and I spoke about this in the speech. It set off what was an incredibly dizzying couple of months. So basically I was invited to speak in late February. The speech was on May 5th. And in the, what, eight weeks or so that separated those two, my oncologist felt a lump, a biopsy determined that that was actually a recurrence of cancer that's considered a local recurrence that's still considered totally curable. They then did a PET scan to see if anything else showed up throughout my body and something lit up in my hip. And lit up is not a good thing with the PET scan with cancer. And fast forward another few weeks, so I had another, I had a third breast surgery to remove the lump here. And I had a biopsy on my hip bone. And that, I mean, two oncologists basically were agreeing we should do this biopsy just to put your concerns to rest because I had actually spoken up about a hip pain for a year and a half earlier and and we had scanned it several times. And anyway, fast forward and that biopsy came back positive for cancer too. And I think I said this to you, but that whole positive thing, it's it's like a positive biopsy. It should be the other way around. (laughs) Positive is not hearing you have cancer for the third time. Um, And you know, it's a little bit, it's not a little bit, it was, it was a lot of bit 
of a devastating blow, right? Like it felt like I got kicked in the stomach because I think I had finally wrapped my head around, okay, it's back here, but we got this, it'll be okay. Like that's an easy, easy surgery. Um, but the hip thing changed the vocabulary that they use. It goes from um, curable to treatable, but not right. curable. It goes from stage two, which is what my original cancer had been to stage four. And I think that's where I also started learning more. Like stage four is not the same for every cancer. And this was considered, this is considered not just treatable, but highly treatable. And, you know, there are a lot of things that um, I need to trust. Like the fact that every single doctor has told me I will be okay. Even though that call on 23rd, I was walking across 23rd street when the doctor called me and I burst into tears. I had a friend holding me. I had the phone in the other ear. And, you know, I kind of said to her, I said, well, am I dying? Because hearing I had cancer in other places, which was not supposed to happen. Um, And she goes, well, yes. And then she elaborated to explain and remind me that we are all, in fact, dying. But they all expected me to still live a very long life. And I think that that's just something I have to always, you know, hold on to is the trust that this is not... um, this is not ideal. It's not what anyone would choose. It's certainly not what I would choose and not what I was led to believe would most likely happen, but it was never impossible that this would happen. And the only choice I get right now is to move forward from where I am right now. Right. And, you know, I'll use your FOMO term. Like I, I missing out on a life without pills and without shots and without, um, the illusion of, of being healthy forever. Right. Cause I think that's what health is. Like, it's not that any of us has promised health for an indefinite period of time. It's just such a gift to be ignorant. You don't of have that. to worry. Yeah. And I don't have a future unless something changes, unless some cure is, is really developed. I don't have a future that doesn't involve a lot of pills and a lot of shots and a lot of things that are keeping me healthy. But my choice right now is to either embrace and celebrate the fact that all those pills and shots exist or not. Right. right? And I feel incredibly lucky to have something that has had so much research put against it and so um, much attention given to it because I have options um, that a lot of cancer patients and a lot of patients of other diseases don't necessarily have. Sally, where can we, uh, this, this speech, I think everybody should watch it because first of all, it's really lovely. I mean, you did an awesome job. And, Thank you. And it got me out of my chair and it stayed with me. But um, just because I think that if you are, um, if you do face like something like this, it's important to have heard stories like the one that you're telling us today. So where can people find more about you? Sure. So I have a website. The URL is my name. So sallywolf.com. It's wolf with one F spelled just W-O-L-F, like the animal. W-O-L-F, like the, like the one that... The like yeah. Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I do love fairy tales. There, yeah. um, so, so that's where I have speeches. I have other things that I've written. Um, it links to my YouTube and everything else. Perfect. All right. So Sally's story was really meaningful to me. I'm really glad to call her a friend and somebody who inspires me on a daily basis. You can find more about her at sallywolf.com. You can find more about FOMO, me, um, and all the things that I'm thinking about at www.patrickmcginnis.com If you go there, you can find also links to all my social and we'll have information about Sally as well. Um, And with that, I'm going to thank you for being here today. Um, We'll see you next time on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO FOMO FOMO